Well, this is proving to be a very special week for thousands of people here. Not just in terms of healing, salvation, being baptized with the Spirit, all these good things from God. But the fact that almost every one of us is gaining a whole new appreciation of God Himself. We thank Him for all He gives. But there's not one thing He gives that compares with what He is. One young man came to me this morning and he said, Is there a Dales next year? I said, Yes. He said, Will it be the same time, same dates? I said, Yes. He said, Now, are you absolutely sure? I said, Yes. He said, well, that's good, he said, because we're getting married and we've got to fix the marriage and the honeymoon so we make it for the Dales. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God does some remarkable togetherness things here. Do you know over recent years a lot of people have found each other here? Numerous weddings have taken place as a result of persons meeting each other at uh, this great conference. So don't give up, girls. <laughs> no boys. <laughs> I want you to turn to Acts chapter 26 tonight. Now Paul under arrest is having to give account of himself before King Agrippa. And Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. In regard to all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate King Agrippa that I am about to make my defense before you today, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. So then, all Jews know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem. Since they have known about me for a long time previously, if they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. And now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. The promise to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, O King, I am being accused by Jews. Why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? So then, I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. While thus engaged, as I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. 
And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But arise and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, delivering you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God in order that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Consequently, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. Consequently, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. I make no apology tonight for almost beginning the week again. For coming in where right at the very start we focused our attention on vision. I'm going to read you several extracts from Edwin Orr's book, The Flaming Tongue, on history of spiritual awakenings in this 20th century. He said, in 1899, just before he died in harness, D.L. Moody opened up his heart on the subject of revival. And this is what D.L. Moody said. Now the question is, shall we have a great and mighty harvest or shall we go on discussing our differences? As far as I am concerned, I am terribly tired of it. And I would like before I go hence to see the whole church of God quickened as it was in 1857. And a wave going from Maine to California that shall sweep thousands into the kingdom of God. A man sick and tired of petty differences with one hunger and passion in heart that before he died, God would hear his prayer for a mighty wave of spiritual awakening across his land. I'm sick and tired of petty differences too, aren't you? Five years later, he didn't live in this life to see it, but five years later, the wave of God broke. And for example, in the United States, in which literally millions of people are swept into the kingdom, here's just a little account from one area in Portland, Oregon. It said, such is the religious enthusiasm in this metropolis that for three hours a day, business is practically suspended. And from the crowds in the great department stores to the humblest clerk, from bank presidents to boot blacks, all abandoned money making for soul saving. Upwards of 200 major stores signed an agreement to close between the hours of 11 and 2 to permit their customers and employees to attend prayer meetings. It wasn't only in such places as the United States which has seen many great awakenings, let me read to you from South India during the same time. One evening, in 1906 at Chambers Hall in Nellore, it was agreed that the Telugu church should be asked to pray every evening until the blessing of revival came. This continued for ten days until one evening the spirit came with power. There was a rumbling noise like distant thunder. And a simultaneous agonizing cry went up from the whole congregation. Some were sobbing, some crying out. And all were confessing their sins and beseeching God for mercy. 
This continued far into the night. Thousands of people were swept into the kingdom at that time. In China, Rosalind Goforth, a missionary at the time, was deeply impressed by the weighty silences of God's presence in the spiritual revival. Already thousands by the time she wrote this had come into the kingdom. She said again and again during these days, when dozens were praying at once and when everyone seemed to be weeping, there came a wonderful sense of quiet. For at such times, no one spoke or prayed or cried aloud. The presence of God never seemed more real. In Africa, during the same period, it said suddenly, in, and this was in Malawi, suddenly there came the sound of a rushing wind. It was the thrilling sound of 2,500 people praying audibly. No man apparently conscious of the other. I could think of no better image to describe the noise than the rushing of wind through the trees. We were listening to the same sound as filled that upper room at Pentecost. Not noisy or discordant. It filled us with great awe. The rapture and power that comes when God reveals himself to men. A longing for renewed displays of his glorious presence. An intense conviction that there is no power in the world so irresistible as the Holy Spirit. Before you say, well, that was all over the world, it seems. India, Africa, China, the United States. Let me read you some more that some of you can readily identify with. In Barrow in Furness, the awakening begun in January and ran unabated through February, hundreds being converted. In Birkenhead, in Liverpool, over the Pennines in Yorkshire, Young people's societies promoted an interest in revival in Kingston-upon-Hull. An awakening developed in Hull that by March the enthusiasm had so increased that the Methodists called it a converting furnace. It had been fed by Pentecostal power and holy enthusiasm as God poured out his spirit. Extraordinary awakenings began in Halifax and Sheffield, it being said that the city of steel has caught the flame. As many as 2,000 attended a single prayer meeting in the manufacturing city of Bradford. A great movement of the Spirit began with blessings unknown since Wesley's times. It was said good news of drunkards being converted and bad news of pubs having to close. <laughs> Geisley, Geisley near Bradford and Leeds witnessed a movement in which one-tenth of the population professed conversion. There were similar reports of results in the city of Leeds where Samuel Chadwick reported that his church was never empty all day every day a remarkable work of grace in Huddersfield also the revival swept the churches and the awakening moved the masses in Newcastle on Tyne almost 700 people rushed to God in a single week in the tiny uh, Durham village in a tiny Durham village 450 people professed conversion in the week Bishop Auckland, and I could go on naming all the places, a great spiritual awakening. Now let me give you some more. Then in September of 1904, in the First Baptist Church of Los Angeles, a man, Joseph Smale, who was then the pastor, was being sent to the Holy Land for a rest and recuperation. On his way home, he visited the principality of Wales to see the great spiritual awakening that was taking place this is his account he went back to his church which was packed to the doors to hear what he had seen and he started with the text this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel and as he said that the Holy Spirit before he got round to the report the Holy Spirit fell on the people 200 penitents rushed to the front to get saved. Sobbing and inarticulate prayer preceded confessions of sin. Both white and black responded. The meetings continued for 15 weeks. 
The crowded gatherings attracted folks far and wide. Down the road, W.J. Seymour from Texas had started a little prayer meeting and a great outpouring of the Holy Ghost took place. And it says the press of people became so great and the action so vigorous that Bonnie Bray building which they were using collapsed, floors, walls and roof. <laughs> the enthusiasts, instead of giving up, found an abandoned Methodist hall on Azusa Street and began a protracted prayer meeting lasting through sessions day and night, every day, every night, for three years. And the Pentecostal wave from that place swept the world. Now I've read that for this reason. All those accounts taking place in the same two-year period together have something in common. Now I know you could say, oh, well of course it was the visitation of God, it was heaven. Yes, that's true. But God always has a trigger point. And the trigger point that had sparked this cry for awakening around the world, the one common factor in them all was a young man called Evan Roberts. He lived in the small town of Lacha in South Wales. He would worked in the coal mines from the age of 12. At 25 years of age, God called him to ministry. And he went as a student to a Bible school. But while he was there, he was so taken up in the burden and cry for spiritual awakening, he was consumed night and day in seeking God, that God would visit the land. And he heard of a man called Seth Joshua who was having some incredible experiences at a town called Newquay. Cardiganshire, I believe that is. And he attended the meetings. And I'll read to you what happened. On Thursday morning, Seth Joshua closed his ministry with a moving prayer, crying out in Welsh, Lord, bend us. Evan Roberts went to the front to kneel and crying in great agony, cried out, Lord, bend me. Seth Joshua made a note in his diary at the time remarking on the prayer of the young man. Whereas Jenkins would organize the meetings was so disturbed by Robert's intensity, fearing that such free expression would produce not a quiet Keswick-style meeting, but a spiritual uproar. He was afraid that young Roberts was a spiritual neurotic. I've heard that recently too. <laughs> Evan Roberts knew that he had reached the crises of his spiritual experience. He felt compelled to pray. Yet still he waited until a few more had prayed when suddenly he felt a living power pervading my bosom. It just took my breath away, he said. His face was bathed in perspiration and he cried out, Bend me. He was overwhelmed by the verse. God commends his love towards us. Then a wave of peace flooded his soul and he became concerned about others. He said at the time, I felt ablaze with the desire to go through the length and breadth of Wales to tell of the Savior and had that been possible, I was willing to pay God for doing so. Following that experience, he wrote home. He wrote to his brother-in-law, Sidney Evans, and he said this, I have a vision of all Wales being lifted up to heaven. We are going to see the mightiest revival the land has ever known. And he asked Sidney Evans directly, do you believe that God can give us a hundred thousand souls now? Sidney Evans never forgot that piercing look on the face of the young man Evan Roberts. He was so in faith of it that he wrote at that time to the editor of a Sunday newspaper and he wrote on Friday the 4th of November asking for an estimate for printing note paper and he said this, we are on the eve of a great and grand revival 
the greatest the world has ever seen. Do not think that the writer is a madman. And the next day, all heaven broke loose. Revival came. Let me repeat one line. I have a vision of all whales being lifted up to heaven. One young man that God met in such a powerful way that the only thing he could sum it all up in, he said, I have a vision. If you were to get a dictionary and look up the word vision, you find it's very, very inadequate to really explain what the Bible means by the term. It says vision is the power of sight. It's the power of imagination. It's what you see in a dream or a trance. But that's not what the Bible means by vision. Neither was it what Evan Roberts meant when he said, I have a vision. Vision is what Hugh shared with us last Sunday. Without a vision, the people perish or are unrestrained, but happy is he who keeps the law. Vision is that that takes in the whole of your life and holds it together. Vision is what you have in your heart of a revelation of God that captures you to such an extent it has now become the dominating force of your life. Yes, amen. That's why the Apostle Paul, as I read tonight, as he stood before King Agrippa, he said, what I saw on that road, it so radically broke in on my life and it so changed the course and direction of my living that I could only say, O King Agrippa, I am not disobedient to the heavenly vision. You see, your vision is you a reason for existence. Let me read to you concerning Jesus. It says, Therefore when Christ comes into the world, He says, Sacrifice and offering thou hast not desired, but a body you have prepared me. In whole offerings and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then said I, this is Jesus, then said I, Behold, I come to do thy will, O God. That was the vision of his life. He came and the reason for his existence was to do the will of God. Your vision is your chief interest in life when you've got it clear. The Apostle Paul says, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ. The chief interest of his life. He says, that heavenly vision has so caught hold of me that everything else I've ever been involved with, he said, I counted loss. It's all rubbish that I might gain Christ. That vision is the power God has put inside you that will urge you on to your destiny. It's that revelation of God that on the inside of you keeps pushing you up when everything in life keeps pushing you down. It keeps urging you on when everything's trying to hold you back. Paul again says, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, and some of you tonight need to forget what lies behind, and reaching forward to what lies ahead, you need to reach. He says, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It's that urging on.
in order to make vision clear to you so that it doesn't just become a re religious cliche let me put it in down-to-earth terms your real vision is what you live for what you invest your time your money and your energy into your vision is what is governing the decisions you're making in life your vision is what is determining the direction you are taking in life your vision is what is shaping your values in life it's what your mind dwells on in neutral when no one else is there and nothing demands your attention your vision is what your mind is dwelling on your vision is what will decide the relationships you make and cultivate in life so that when you read the heavenly vision ask yourself before you say oh I have a vision ask yourself what are you living for what's your money going into where's your time spent what companions do you keep what relationships are you cultivating what's your mind dwelling on because that's the reality of it Christianity is more than a philosophy of life it's both a revelation and an experience of God our whole spiritual progress is determined by revelation not information information has to do with the mind it's not how much you know from the book it's how much of God is on the inside Now, vision may come to you in different ways. Most of us found our vision becoming clearer as we progressed in God. I don't want you to suddenly bail out tonight and think, man, he's wiped me out already because I'm not clear. No, vision is often a progressive thing. God unfolds it. If every, any one of us had seen all that we see today in one fell swoop at the start, I don't know if many of us would have had the faith to go forward. Some of you, in the decisions you've made this last ten years or five years or three years or one year in your church, I don't know if you'd have had the faith to go into what you're now into if you'd seen all that it involves at the beginning. And so God is gracious. He unfolds just enough to quicken a faith in you and a thirst so that in hungering and thirsting and in faith you reach. And God keeps moving you on with further revelations as you go. Now it might come to you like a spiritual encounter on Damascus Road as Paul had. In one moment of time, he had his destiny unfolded to him. He knew what God's objective was in saving him and he was given the Holy Go to get moving. It might come that way, dramatic. It might be like young prophet Isaiah. It wasn't quite as dramatic on a Damascus Road type experience but it was nevertheless just as real and gripping and shaping of his life as he went into the temple when King Uzziah died and he said I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne lofty and exalted with his train filling the temple he said I saw the cherubim and the seraphim and I saw and I heard holy 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 as that great movement of heaven took place it might be that God in a time of great spiritual lifting up a time like the Dales week for example where you're somewhere alone on this ground in prayer God may be gracious to open your eyes to see beyond the veil of the natural to see the Lord high and lifted up but for the majority of us for the majority in this place the revelation has come through the Word of God itself just as it did to Abraham it says of Abram after these things the word of the Lord came to Abram in vision and the Lord said do not fear Abram 
I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. It doesn't matter how the vision comes to you. The important thing is this. What effect it has and what response you make. What effect has a vision of God had on your life? No man can meet God and remain unchanged. The person who tells me that they've met God and their life is no different is telling a lie. There's an effect on you when you see God. The effect is like this. Firstly, it's this. You can never be the same again. You're spoiled to the way you once lived. You're no good. You've seen God. It's changed you. Go try and be the same as you used to be. You'll be miserable. Tell you what. You'll never fit again into that old life. You'll go amongst the world and the companionships you used to have and the, the places you used to go and you can try and blot out that revelation you had of Jesus and his love for you and you can try and fit into the old mold but it's not the same. You're sitting there all the time and you're trying to laugh and look happy but inside you're awkward, you don't fit. And those with whom you're now meeting, they're laughing but you don't fit with them either. And they think, I wish this bloke could go away. There's something different about him. You can't be the same again. But if you've had a deep revelation of God, it's done this to you too. It's put in you a desire. You don't want to be the same again. You don't want to go back to that old thing. Furthermore, it's going to do this to you. From now on, you, what you've seen, you find you live in pursuit of it. You understand what Paul is talking about when he talks about reaching forward, pressing to a goal, trying to reach that objective God's arrested him for. You're in pursuit. Why are you here this week? Because you're looking for something. Why are you coming morning after morning, night after night? Because your heart is reaching for something. Why is it that for some people it's year after year? They give such valuable time to be at a place like this. I'll tell you why. Because your hearts deep down inside you are hungering and thirsting after God whom you've seen in your spirit. You can't be the same again. You don't want to be the same again. You're in pursuit of the God you've seen. And I'll tell you what else it'll do for you. It won't let you stop until you reach there. He who's begun a good work in you is going to go on to complete it. We're on our way to great things. Now not only must it have this kind of effect on you, but vision is only as good as your response. Do you know that today you are the result of the responses and choices you've made in life already? What you are as a person today is the result of choices you've made, some of them going back to your childhood. Where you are in God tonight, the spiritual level you're enjoying of fellowship with Him, the spiritual place of faith that you're moving in is a direct result of choices and responses you've made to His Spirit already in life. Because the power to respond positively to God or to turn away from what He's showing you always lies with yourself. You can never blame God if you miss the vision. God doesn't play hide and seek, He shows Himself. Paul says, when that heavenly vision came, it came not just to give me a great picture of God, but it came and captured me, told me what my life was towards. And he said, I couldn't be disobedient. There was a compelling power to obey that accompanied that vision. The key to the effectiveness of all vision you have is your obedient response to what you're saying. Now what I want to do tonight is this. I want to begin 
to share in four dimensions of life important areas that you and I need vision in. Four important dimensions of life that need vision. And what you see in each of them will determine the kind of person you are, the accomplishments that you make, and the future you'll enjoy. Firstly this, your vision of God. It sounds so ordinary as a phrase, but you know it's your vision of God that is the highest revelation determining everything else in your life. Ezekiel, when he was amongst the captives and the exiles down by the river Heba, he said this. He said, I had visions of God. Hallelujah. The men that have changed their generation, the men that have turned this world upside down over the years, have all been men who first and foremost had a vision of God himself. think the way others think when you get out there into your car and you start off for work you're not going out like the next door neighbor who doesn't know Jesus is you're going out different you're aware of God there's a God consciousness you stop at the traffic lights you're thinking of God somebody toots the horn behind you see it's green and you're going again <laughs> And on the way to work, you, you go through ten traffic lights. And when you get the other side, you step out so calm. Whereas the other poor fellow, every traffic light, he was getting more and more knotted up. Frustrated. Because there was a peace of God in your life. A God-filled mind. You were moving the word of God in you. Living by the Spirit. See, every one of you who's born again, do you know you have a dimension to life that no other person outside of Christ has? And that's called a spirit that's alive to God. Oh, yeah. You can't be saying, you know, I have, a, I have this strange feeling today. Don't ignore it. It wasn't curry late at night. <laughs> I just... Feel in God that I, I need to... We need to heed more the promptings of the Spirit in us. It's a supernatural life. Oh, I hope you've discovered the supernatural dimension to a revelation of God. See, if you live on the ordinary plane, the first headache and you run for the aspirins. But if you're living on the supernatural thing, whatever's afflicting you, your first thinking is, I'm going to God. And I'm not just going to God in despair, I'm going expecting. The whole thing is there. Yesterday I was writing down some scriptures and time was running out of me. We're getting close to prayer meeting. And I looked and I had four more scriptures I wanted to write out in full. And I thought... <sighs> And instantly I just began to feel a little pressure. And I thought, wait a minute, I don't need to feel pressure about this. I said, Father, please help me quickly get these scriptures. Now let me show you what happens. This is genuine. I turned the Bible, there was the number one I wanted. I wrote it down. I turned the other one, where's the next one I was needing to turn? I had all the verses I wanted to turn up and four in a row. And I turned every one up with a flip of a Bible like that. Now you try it tonight and see if it comes out coincidentally. <laughs> huh? Write four scripture references down and try it tonight and see if by coincidence you can turn everyone up. I tell you, this is supernatural we're into. Right down to the minute details of life. Some weeks ago when we were leaving the United States to come back to this country, I had one outstanding bill that I needed to declare. There was a considerable amount of money. And I wanted to get it done and we'd been saving for our, uh, several months. And at the time, the bill amounted to just over $5,000, which is about, I don't know right now, about 3,000 pounds. And we'd got about $1,000 saved towards it. And I thought, oh God, 
We want to come out of this thing clear. And uh, I, I just began seeking the Lord, and I felt the Lord speaking to me about the whole question of God's resources. And bro you know, God isn't bankrupt or broke or coffers empty in heaven and trying to borrow from Nat West or something like that. <laughs> hey? I thought, Lord, I've got a thousand dollars, and God gave me the secret of getting the whole bill paid. He told me to give the thousand and to sow it, to sow it into another brother, another situation. So I shared it with my wife. We shared it with our children. I said, we're going to learn the principle of sowing again and reaping again. We sowed it within three days. A brother was just never, to my knowledge, in all the years I was there, has he ever been moved to give me one dollar. Just came out, when it left the church, came back to me. When, and he said, by the way, bro, he said, I want you to have this. Five thousand dollars. I said, are you sure? <laughs> and the Lord spoke inside me and said, what do you mean, is he sure? <laughs> he said, of course I'm sure. I thought, oh, Father. See? You know, some people have a sowing mentality. You need a harvest mentality. Some of you have been putting in each night here and you think, oh gosh, here again. <laughs> huh? Do you know why you're so short in life? Because that's your attitude, here again. Oh, not another offering. Oh gosh, how much more can I keep sowing? Well, listen, why don't you start having a harvest mentality, harvest thinking, so that each night as it comes along, you see it as a great opportunity to reap Amen. and sow your giving. That's what the Bible says. Giving's all about. You read it in the New Testament. It says a seed, God's given you your money as seed to sow. Now the fact that we're living as spiritual and supernatural dimensions this way doesn't mean, of course, that we are immune to the pressures of life. We're not some sort of religious mystic. It's this, that we relate to life but from a different standpoint. It isn't that Christians don't get problems. How many know Christians don't get problems? Do get problems, I mean. Three of us at least. It isn't that we don't find pressure. It isn't that. It's just that we have what it takes in the spirit and in the supernatural of God to meet those things from a different standpoint. Firstly is this. You don't go under them. You stand over them. Oh, it's terrible when you live under your circumstances. Do you know what you live? You live in depression. But when you live on top of those circumstances, you're ruling the situation. Just... It, it, you see, it's all striving and effort when you go under the circumstance. You remember them in the boat when uh, Jesus had sent them ahead of him and they're striving and the storm is there and they're pulling and they're making no headway? It can be very... It, it's a terrible time when life's like that for you. When you go under the pressure. It's not long before you're mourning and groaning about it and accusing others. I wonder what the atmosphere was like in the boat. Huh? We started off, you know, the church of God is moving. Church of, eh? Eh? After a little while, it's Peter that says, Thomas, are you catching the sail right with that wind back there? Poor old Thomas tries again, and the wind changed. He tried again, and the wind, it says, was contrary. It kept changing. And Thomas thought, man, I'm, I'm, I'm losing face, and uh, I'm, I'm getting ashamed again with Peter. I'm sure the atmosphere got very grotty. Brother, will you get that sail right? Yeah. All the choruses stopped an hour ago. <laughs> because they're under the sea. And then, oh, I won't go on with it, but just to tell you this, do you know what Jesus did when he showed up? He came walking on the water. Walking along. They're fighting their circumstance and he's ruling it. 
They're battling with the wind. And there was a great peace center all around Jesus as he walked it. Oh, hallelujah, he's coming. <laughs> Do you know the Bible says he intended to pass them by? <laughs> hallelujah, he's coming. No, it's a ghost. Because if it was him, he'd get in the boat with us. Look what he's doing. Mm. Mm. Jesus was... I, I believe this. I won't ask you a question and I'll just tell you this. I believe Jesus was intending to pass them by to provoke them to get out of the boat and do what he was doing. See? I want, to rule, I want you to live life from a different dimension. I want you to learn to live on top of your circumstances instead of underneath them all the time. Instead of striving and straining and battling, live in victory. Because you see, the life you now live is a shared life. Listen to what Paul says. I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live. Did you hear that? It is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. That's the new dimension living. It's shared life. You die to all your past. You're crucified with Christ and the world and all that it's got's crucified. It's all finished with, but you've come alive in a new dimension. See, something has to die all the time to support life. And to enjoy this life of God, you've got to die. You say, well, how can I kill myself? It's already happened. Believe it. You died in Him when He died. I have been crucified with Christ. See, death always gives way to life. And when you reckon yourself dead back there to all that's your past, you can start counting yourself alive to God. If you want the proof of it that all life is sustained by death, Aren't you glad that the hamburger you ate today didn't go moo? <laughs> Just think of picking up the drumstick down at the canteen and it does cock a doodle -doo. <laughs> You're living because things die. I'm alive in Christ, <laughs> but I'm dead to what I was. See, that spiritual and supernatural and shared life that you've got in God today, it sets you apart from all the rest of the world. You are now moral foreigners to this age. Just as Jesus was to the age in which he lived. There are two essential things in a revelation of God that will govern your faith response in life. They're these. That in that revelation of God, you see him in all his greatness. The Bible starts off, in the beginning, God. Nothing before him. And no explanation as to anything before him. God doesn't feel he needs to explain. He just says, in the beginning, me. That's why we're hopeless when we're witnessing to atheists and agnostics. Because I can't even begin to find anything in me trying to explain an answer to some of the questions they have, such as, where did God come from? Well, he didn't come from anybody. He was always there. But, I, see, the Bible starts off like this. It says, he that comes to God must first believe that he is. The only hope for the atheist is to give up his atheism and at least believe God is before he can get anywhere. Oh, 
to see that there was nothing before God and that means this, he's the source of everything, the sustainer of everything. Everything exists because he brought it into being and the moment he was to say quit, it's all gone. Oh, the greatness of God, everything you see. I'd love to have been there when it all was coming into being. God, I'm not, a knockout really, isn't it? <laughs> God says, let there be. Boom! The earth appeared. And all the angels said, <gasps> God said again, let there be. And boom! It all separates out. And as he kept saying, let there be, wonders started happening. Great things started springing out. Life started appearing. Worlds came into being. It, it, all heaven got delirious with excitement. It says the morning stars shouted for joy. All those angels started dancing and jumping and shouting, more, 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 more. <laughs> now I've got news for you. He's not stopped creating. You are new creations, every one of you of God. He's every day. We've had new creation going on here this week. He says, let there be a life has come into your life. You and I should be popping all inside of ourselves. We should be jumping up and down all the time, lying on bed trying to sleep and our mind is popping. <laughs> There's only one top of the pops to me and that's Jesus. When the shepherds were sitting out on the hillside watching their little flocks having their usual grumble about the economy. <laughs> Market prices up in Bethlehem this week again. <laughs> I'm going to have to ask my wife to make me cocoa. I can't have any more drinks. It's just an ordinary Friday night. It's, it's just ordinary, you see. It's just the usual little thing. And suddenly, a sound comes. It's in the sky. Nobody says anything at first. The hair on the back of the neck goes up. They look up. Suddenly, it's filling the heavens. Angels are coming down. Great multitudes of them. And they're singing a song, Glory to God! in the highest and on earth peace on those with whom he is pleased glory to God in the highest that's your first revelation of God do you see him in the highest he's not only before all he's above all if there's no expl explanation as to where he came from because he didn't come from anywhere, there's no exception to those that are under him because he's above all. That means that all your impossibilities are possible. That means there's nothing that's touching your life that God can't take care of because he's over it all. Abram found that out. A powerful man. Have a look at this with me in Romans. <clears throat> Romans chapter 4. Father's been good to me. You see, I flipped that page and they did it again. It's unbelievable really, isn't it? Romans 4. I just want to show you the greatness of God a moment. Verse 13, it says, For the promise of Abram or to to Abram or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law but through the righteousness of faith for if those who are of the law are heirs faith is made void and the promise is nullified for the law brings about wrath but where there is no law neither is there violation for this reason it is by faith that it might be in accordance with grace it is by faith that it might be in accordance with grace say that with me it is by faith that it might be in accordance with grace again it is by faith that it might be in accordance with grace. We'll come to that again later, uh, either tonight or tomorrow, but we'll go on now. In order 
that the promise may be certain to all the descendants not only to those who are of the law but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham who is the father of us all as it is written the father of many nations I have made you in the sight of him whom he believed even God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist look at that God calls into being that which does not exist in hope against hope he believed this is Abram now in order that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken so shall your descendants be and without becoming weak in faith he contemplated his own body now as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb yet with respect to the promise of God he did not waver in unbelief but grew strong in faith giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised he was able also to perform right let's let's jump into Abram's tent a minute ready one two three two we're there Abram gets up in the morning shines that steel mirror and looks at himself gosh he's more bowed over than ever four more wrinkles man he's white he's hundred years old now sort of gone huh? yeah. Better get a cup of tea for Sarah. <laughs> Takes it on in to Sarah, bless her heart. She said, oh, is it morning already? Oh, it's morning already. He says, yes, dear. Got a cup of for you. And he goes off for his quiet time. He's standing before the Lord and suddenly God shows up. He says, Abraham, you're going to have the son. <laughs> Sarah is going to bear you a son. That's right, you don't have to think you'll leave it all to Eliezer. You're going to have a son and through him every nation of the world will get blessed. <sighs> Shine that mirror. to go get Sarah a glass of wine <laughs> well dear are you up Well, dear, are you up now? Yes? I've got good news for you. You're going to have a child. Now look what the Bible says, he contemplated his body. He said, you're going to have a child? Come stand with me by a minute. <laughs> she said, do you really think we... Are you sure, Abraham? Are you sure now? 
Yes, man. Look at me. Come on. I'll book us into Motel Promise for the weekend. <laughs> well, this is.